everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for SNF Agora Conversations, the politics and policy of COVID-19. I'm Hari Han, a professor of political science and director of the SNF Agora Institute here at Johns Hopkins University. For those of you who don't know, the SNF Agora Institute is an academic and public forum dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and an informed inclusive dialogue as a cornerstone of global democracy. SNF Agora Conversations is a new initiative that we launched um, in which we're trying to take a weekly social scientific evidence-based approach to exploring some of the most vexing political and policy questions surrounding the coronavirus pandemic. Today's topic is the dynamics of race and othering around COVID-19. And I'm delighted to have with me two fabulous guests. Um, we have Aaron Chung, who is a Charles D. Miller Associate Professor of East Asian Politics in the Department of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. She previously served as director of the East Asian Studies Program and co-director of the Racism, Immigration, and Citizenship Program at Hopkins. We also have with us Jamila Michener, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Her research focuses on poverty, racial inequality, and public policy, including especially health policy in the United States. Thank you all for being with us today. We're really grateful to have your expertise with us. So today, the three of us are going to spend about 30 minutes talking about the dynamics of race and othering around COVID-19. The impacts of COVID-19 and social distancing across the nation and all over the world cannot be understood without examining the ways in which they interact with long-standing structural racial inequities and patterns of othering that we've seen. So we want to try to understand how those patterns are playing out in today's crisis. And then we'll open it up for your questions. Anytime throughout this conversation, you can submit your question through the dialog box, which will either be to the right of your screen or to the bottom, depending on the device that you're using to watch the webcast. So let me turn now to Jamila and Aaron. And Jamila, maybe I'll start with you, um, because long before any of us had ever even heard the word coronavirus, um, or most of us, um, you had been studying the dynamics of race um, and issues of health, which obviously have been um, you know, things of concern for a very long time. And so I'm sure in some ways, it was really not a surprise for you to see some of the disparate impacts that we're beginning to see around coronavirus. And so I wonder if you can just start by describing what you're seeing with respect to race and coronavirus um, from, from your vantage point. Sure, I think you know, you're know you absolutely right. When this first started to, to become like a prominent part of the news cycle, the first thing I did was Google race coronavirus. And I remember I would Google it every day and I was doing that for about two weeks and just astonished that nothing was coming up. And I felt like I knew, I knew it was just a matter of time. And so, you know, in the last few weeks we've started to see more and more data and information come to the surface that's brought to light what I think those of us who have been paying attention to race for a long time aren't expected, um, aren't surprised to see. And that's really, uh, people of color, in particular Black and Latino Americans, bearing a disproportionate burden of illness and death stemming from this violence. So, uh, from this virus, not violence. <laughs> um, so data from the CDC shows overrepresentation of, um, of Blacks as patients, hospitalized patients uh, in, in, of coronavirus, right? And in cities like New York, New Orleans, Detroit, Chicago and many more, Milwaukee. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, these cities have kept track of rates of infection and illness and death as a result of the coronavirus. And again and again, we're hearing um, very similar stories from these places, which is uh, stark differences in rates of infection and death uh, with the kind of heaviest burden being borne uh, by Black and Latino populations. Um, in New York City, for example, uh, death rates among, uh, among Black Americans hover at around 92.3 deaths per 100,000. That same number is 74.3 for Latinos, 45.2 for whites, right? And, and we see that in various forms in different cities across the country. In Chicago, data from early April suggested that 72% of people who died from coronavirus in Chicago uh, were, were Black, even though Blacks account for only a third of the city's population. So these patterns are widespread and they're consistent and they're alerting us to a problem um, and to disproportionalities that mean that people of color are being hurt in unique ways by this virus. And maybe just one quick follow-up, Jamila, to ask you is, um, 
So the, the, the numbers that you gave us are obviously very striking. And um, what can you say more about why it is that you think we're seeing some of the disparate impacts and what's what are the sort of long-standing inequities that are coming that are being revealed by the statistics that you just shared with us? Yeah, you know, when I tell people I'm not surprised or I knew this was coming, sometimes I wonder or I worry that it makes me look like a negativist, right? But it, in fact, what it means is that this is consistent with with the history of health and race in the United States. And it's consistent with essentially all of the existing patterns um, mm -hmm. that, that we might identify as being relevant to race and health in the United States. It's a reflection of institutionally embedded structural inequalities, right? So for example, compared to their white counterparts, uh, black people are more likely to have chronic underlying health conditions, right? Mm -hmm. The same is true, although in different ways and at times to a lesser extent uh, for Latinos, but it means that they're more physically vulnerable to the virus. And those chronic underlying diseases that are more likely in those populations are, are not a function of the different choices that people are making, but really they're about a history of discrimination in our in our medical systems, in hospitals as institutions, various forms of, for example, implicit bias. So mm -hmm. biases that people don't even realize that they have, that mm -hmm. a doctor might have in their interaction with a patient or a nurse might have in their interaction with a patient. There's lots of evidence suggesting that those kinds of biases are happening in our, in our hospital and, and healthcare system and that they disproportionately affect uh, people of color. Um, and then we look to where people live, right? Residential segregation, the fact that uh, Black people live largely around other Black and Brown people is directly linked to health disparities. And that right. is a, a function of uh, housing inequalities. And we right. can go right down the list to air pollution and you know environmental injustices and how those disproportionately affect people of color. I mean, I could spend at least the next hour, probably much, much more going through the various kind of right. institutional factors that explain these differences. Yeah. Well, so Aaron, I'd love to, to bring you into this conversation. Um, I want to think about some of the um, global dynamics around this, but before we turn to the conversation about the global dynamics, um, I'd love it if you could talk about the sort of particularities of um, Asian, of sort of Asian American racism and how that's playing out because people of color in the U.S. have not only been contracting and dying from COVID-19 at disproportionate rates in the way that Jamila just shared with us, but also subject to backlash against it. And with the virus originating in China, political leaders have often found it handy to, to other or scapegoat Asians during this pandemic. And so, um, you know, I think this story is, is, is coming out in really complex ways um, for anyone who is Asian American, you know, because we also see stories of the rise in gun sales among Asians and other things like that. So I'm wondering if you can um, talk a little bit about sort of the how the patterns that we're seeing today relate to patterns of xenophobia and othering that have always been present in the Asian experience. Sure, yeah. So when the CDC announced earlier that um, everyone in the United States should be wearing a face covering um, in public, uh, my partner and I had the same reaction. Um, we both said that, you know, such a mandate would really pose a threat to racial minority populations who are already targets of racist attacks. Um, uh -huh. So as an African-American man, my partner was concerned that wearing a face covering would feed into racialized images of black and brown males as potential criminals and thus inviting further discrimination and police harassment. And as an Asian American woman, I worried that wearing a face mask would feed into images of Asians as carriers, right, of the so-called foreign virus. Um, so Jamila brought up some really important points about deservingness and how the crisis has exacerbated existing racial disparities for already vulnerable populations. But it's also added fuel to racist ideas that have historically excluded Asians from U.S. citizenship and even the right to enter the United States. And that continue to reproduce the idea that Asians are immutably foreign and don't belong here. Um, so as we're alluding to, Hari, um, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in China, we've witnessed the highest rates of anti-Asian attacks since 
Um, Asians have been subjected to racist slurs that associate them with the disease and have been verbally and physically attacked while walking on the street, riding on public transportation, and even just shopping in their neighborhoods. And while these incidents have been uh, covered widely in the media and have drawn condemnation by public officials, they've also been spurred by the White House's use of the phrase Chinese virus, right? And um, according to um, one particular vocal um, uh, observer, Congresswoman Judy Chu, there have been almost 100 anti-Asian attacks reported per day throughout the United States. And the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council has announced that almost 1,500 reports of anti-Asian incidents from 45 states and Washington, D.C. have been reported in just the last month. Right? Now, the association of Asians with disease has a long history in the United States that's really undergirded by the assumption that Asians are an alien presence. Um, the first large scale immigration of Chinese laborers to the United States in the 1840s was accompanied by exclusionary policies that really prevented family formation, um, that limited Chinese immigrants to a handful of occupations, mostly uh, mining and uh, railroads, and forced the overwhelmingly male population to live in uh, segregated Chinatown ghettos. Um, they were also ineligible for U.S. citizenship uh, based on their non-white non status, according to the 1790 naturalization law. Now, these very conditions have give, gave rise to stereotypes of Chinese men as asexual eunuchs or predators of white women, of Chinatown as you know, dirty, dangerous, and exotic, and the Chinese as inscrutable and unassimilable. So these were, they were increasingly then viewed also as threats to native workers in the mid to late 1800s. And public officials began to weaponize these stereotypes to link Chinese immigrants with so-called foreign diseases like smallpox and syphilis that were characterized as the products of their backwards unhygienic practices and traditions. So this then set the stage for the enactment of the um, 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which marked the first time in U.S. immigration history that excluded immigrants based on their race as opposed to their nationality. Now, we can identify parallels to this today in narratives about the so-called Chinese virus or China virus that really feed into racist ideas about barbaric and unhygienic traditions. This narrative really focuses our attention on the foreign contagion, right, rather than on community spread, and then associates a racialized category of people with disease. That's really, I mean, it's really interesting what you say, the kind of um, distinction you point out between focusing us on community spread, which is really what the public health uh, officials are trying to get us to do, and instead focusing on this idea that it's brought in by this foreign um, presence. And so, um, you know, we had a question that came in that I'd love to um, bring into the conversation now. I know that we're, uh, we're um, which is really a question that a, someone named Hannah asked, which is, you know, what is the extent to which the patterns that we're seeing in the United States are being experienced by other countries? And, you know, Aaron, maybe I'll, I'll um, pitch this to you just because as a scholar of migration, it'd be great for you to talk a little bit about what you're seeing globally in terms of these patterns of racism and xenophobia um, that not just in the United States, but elsewhere also. Well, I think we can identify um, two kind of interrelated patterns, okay. um, all of which predate the pandemic, but have also been exacerbated by it. So um, first, of course, is the scapegoating of minority and migrant populations in uh, public discourse and interactions. There have been numerous reports of anti-Chinese, anti-Asian attacks throughout the world. Um, an informal uh, survey, for example, on COVID-19 related anti-Asian incidents in Europe drew over a hundred responses in just a few days from people in countries like the Netherlands, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Um, we, we also see anti-Chinese backlash in other parts of Asia. And we saw this especially in January and February. Um, Motoko Rich of the New York Times um, reported that um, there were no Chinese allowed signs that had been posted in businesses in Japan and Vietnam. And a business in Hong Kong even announced that it would only serve customers speaking English or Cantonese, the latter of which is of course distinct from the uh, Mandarin spoken in mainland China. 
But Chinese and those who are mistaken for Chinese are not the only ones who've been targeted. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so there've been reports of Chinese and Southeast Asian migrant workers in South Korea being subjected to verbal harassment, arbitrary dismissal from their jobs and denied entry into public spaces. Um, and in China, as China has been attempting to stave off a second wave in, of infections after its recent recovery, we're seeing a backlash against foreigners in China who are accused of driving the resurgence of the coronavirus, right? Yeah. Now, this is despite the fact that most of the imported cases are from Chinese nationals who've returned to China. But the backlash has been directly, um, has been uh, directed largely to Africans in China, especially in Guangzhou. Um, and not only have they been denied service at restaurants or turned away at um, local hotels and even evicted from their homes, but the, but the xenophobic attacks against them go far beyond their foreign status, as they've been based on kind of racist statements about Africans as, you know, lazy and unhygienic drug addicts or thieves, which are, again, um, racist narratives that really predate um, the crisis. Yeah. Um, the second broad pattern that we can identify um, is the enactment of sweeping immigration restrictions on the one hand and the corrosion of already fragile safety nets and protections for migrants, refugees, and displaced populations on the other. So the um, International Organization for Migration has reported that more than 190 countries have implemented border closures, travel restrictions, and travel, uh, travel bans as emergency measures for both containment and mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, some countries such as Canada, Germany, and Israel are only allowing their own citizens and permanent residents to enter with some exceptions such as for diplomats, airline crew, and uh, humanitarian humanitarian actors, while others like India, um, Nigeria, and Thailand have suspended flights or closed airports entirely, again, with some limited exceptions. And these countries, um, and those countries that have more like partially open borders, like South Korea, still require a 14-day uh, quarantine of those who right. enter. Um, I think what's even more tr troubling are what I think might be long-term trends. So countries like the United States, Greece, and Hungary are also barring new asylum applications. And even mm -hmm. Canada announced it would cease to accept um, as asylum se seekers from the U.S. at unofficial crossings. Um, there have also been the construction of new detention centers and camps and increasing numbers of asylum seekers and other migrants who've been placed in these centers. And yeah. as you know, the Trump administration has introduced some of the most stringent immigration restrictions uh, in decades, including the closure of the U.S.-Mexican border, um, as well as a U.S.-Canadian border to non-essential uh, travel, which is basically um, the former has really kind of effectively ended asylum at the U.S.-Mexican yeah. border. And now, so, you know, one. Oh, oh sorry. Ahead. I just one last thing is that. Um, the administration's most recent um, proposal to order a 60-day halt on issuing green cards um, has been in the, under the guise of protecting American workers. But this is, again, something that a move that had been really predating the, the yeah. virus, right? Yeah. You know, so, um, Aaron, one of the things that's so interesting about what you're saying is you describe the patterns that we're seeing all over the world is that... Um, it's, it's not just the particularity of anti-Asian sentiment that, you know, we, we started off um, discussing, but that really there's this pattern of othering of all different kinds of people and this question of who really belongs that every country is um, grappling with as they make decisions about how they want to um, respond to the pandemic. And, um, you know, putting that together with the things, Jamila, that you were saying in the beginning, I feel like one thing that's really striking me about our conversation as far is just the complexity of the dynamics of race and xenophobia and inequality and health and, and this hum, you know, seemingly almost human tendency to, to other and, and, and draw um, boundaries around who we think really belongs in whatever country that, um, that we're in. And so it, I want to pivot our conversation to starting to think about, you know, given the patterns that we're seeing that we've already discussed, what's next you know what are the things that we can and and should be doing and it seems to me at least from based on our conversation one of the truths about that is that you have to be able to hold multiple truths together <laughs> you know that as we think about these pathways out there's no clear-cut good guy bad guy kind of response and so 
Jamila, I know that you've thought about these kinds of questions a lot in some of the other work that you're that you've already done, and um, you know it's, it's hard to ask you to boil down a career's worth of work, <laughs> you know, into a short answer. But I wonder if you have um, some initial thoughts that you want to sketch for our audience um, in thinking about how the trends that we're seeing now interact with um, what's come before and what we have to do to go up to move ahead. Um, I think those those are that's a great kind of direction to go in. And and I think that Aaron laid a lot of the groundwork for going there just by pointing out uh, patterns that are broad. Right. And and that that indicate a certain continuity um, so that even where there are differences, uh, there's also continuity. So, you know, in China, for example, uh, the sentiment isn't sort of anti-Chinese, but it's uh, now the, the lens turns to Africans, right? Um, in, in India, there's been increased Islamophobia, which seems so distinct from, you know, what, what's happening uh, in the U.S. or what's happening in China, but reflects pre-existing uh, conditions and biases that existed there. I, I think one thing that this does is it pushes us to realize that um, the, the kinds of uh, the patterns of division in various societies and various countries um, are, are only amplified by this crisis. And so mm -hmm. what, what that means is that uh, one thing that, that, that the crisis should lead us to do is to really pay attention to those patterns of division, to center them and highlight them, and to think more critically about them than we would have before. I think that's something that's not always easy or that's really not ever easy. So in the US context, for example, um, there, there are continual arguments about, well, you know, how big of a factor is, is you know, structural injustice or racism? And well, maybe, you know, we're beyond this. And it's been a long time since the civil rights movement. And um, maybe it's all the talking about racism that actually makes it such an, a, an impactful force. I think one of the things that this crisis does is in, in a way it settles a lot of those, uh, the debates and gives us some focus, right? That these mm -hmm. divides are real things. They're real things and we know they're real things because when we are in a moment of public health crisis, uh, it, they, the divides emerge as the kind of points um, where we see differences and disparities. And so, you know, for us, for everyone to get on board with the reality that, you know, and we need not waste time anymore wondering, well, just how much does inequality matter? We can start hopefully together at a point of consensus. Okay, clearly these inequalities matter. And now what do we do about them? And, and I think that that initial point of consensus is easy to overlook, but it's not something that, that we've had um, mm -hmm. in the US or even um, globally. And I think once we get to that point of consensus, then there are a lot of hard questions uh, that, that we have to face. And I think the kind of the, the structural depth of some of these problems means uh, that it's not really about people getting along better, um, mm -hmm. people tolerating each other more uh, effectively, um, people having sort of kumbaya, open your arms to one another moments. Those things are all great. Of course, I want people to get along better. But, but, <laughs> but what these disparities point to are structural problems, right? So how, what are the changes that make it so that when I walk into a hospital or I'm meeting or, you know, with a doctor or I'm seeking some kind of care, I get the same thing that someone who looks very different than me will get. And mm -hmm. what are the ways that we think about entrenched problems that, that in the US we've faced for, for forever, right? And in yeah. other country, the countries, the nature of those entrenched problems are different, but the degree of entrenchment is often comparable. And so when we think about um, housing inequalities that make uh, people you know, often not live together with other people, yeah. We're different from them. And when we think about environmental injustice, that means we're exposed to different pollutants and that that exposure is a function of race and class. I think those are difficult structural problems that now we have to begin tackling and talking about um, and, and thinking about in structural terms, right? So not in terms of individuals or feelings or prejudices, but in terms of concrete policy changes that can alleviate 
the disparities that are now being highlighted for us so prominently. Yeah, that's great. Um, so um, I want to ask one last question to both of you before we pivot to questions. Um, we're already getting some great questions, but uh, just as a reminder for the audience, if you have any questions, you can just put them into the dialog box um, that's either to the right or the, the bottom of your screen. But before we turn to questions, um, let me pose one last question for both of you. I think that really builds directly on what you just said, Jamila. And um, you know, I'll just start by saying that um, for me, like the pandemic has this weird way of feeling both immediately, very immediate and very distant at the same time, right? It's immediate in the sense that all of us, whether we have been sick ourselves or had someone in our family who's sick, um, has have had our lives turn upside down uh, because the world is, you know, because of social distancing and everything like that. But then it also feels very distant in the sense that, you know, as someone who's not a healthcare provider, I feel like there's not much I can do as I see these cri this crisis playing out. Um, before me in a lot of ways. And so what I hear you saying, Jamila, and I think it really picks up on a lot of what you were saying, Aaron, in your um, earlier comments as you were describing the trends that we're seeing all over the world is that the, the pandemic, you know, reveals the inextricable ways in which we're so interdependent with each other. And it, it calls on us, it's a clarifying moment, as Jamila pointed out, to create a new kind of social compact together. But the question I want to pose to you is, is how do we do that in a way that isn't just kumbaya in the um, ways you know, that you're talking about, but that really move us towards actions that can begin to address the longstanding structural problems. And, um, and so I know that's a it's a it's a tough and it's a big question, but Aaron, maybe I'll turn it to you, and then um, Jamil ask you to respond before we open it up for questions. Sure. Um, so I think you know there are two you know prongs that we can um, approach. So you know we know that. COVID-19 has no borders, right? And it mm -hmm. doesn't recognize nationality, race, or creed. Um, and certainly the virus doesn't make ex exemptions for high-ranking officials or diplomats, despite the fact that our travel restrictions do. Um, and specific national or ethnic groups are not more prone to the virus than others just based on uh, biology. But our responses to the virus have been really rooted in the legacies of racism and xenophobia that have really spread their contagion in public policies, uh, discourse, and everyday interactions. So I think you know one um, part is we really need to rethink our migration management tools. Um, mm -hmm. You know the typical tools that governments use to manage migration are really insufficient for managing a global virus born out of a global economy, right? So immigration restrictions that may keep some migrants out, but they will not necessarily restrict the mobility of elite global citizens for whom borders and immigration controls are largely irrelevant. So in other words, they're not gonna be applied to investors and tourists who are wooed for their capital. Mm -hmm. And the increasingly draconian immigration restrictions are making migrants really more vulnerable to contracting and dying from the virus, you know, as they resort to more desperate measures to reach um, ever more narrow ports of entry or are placed in overcrowded detainment facilities and have to weigh the risks of detainment or deportation against um, getting tested even when they have symptoms. So I think a way for us as individuals to really move forward um, is through civic engagement. So I think that's that's key. And I know that it's it's strange. To, it might be strange to say that when we're you know doing the social distancing thing, but. Um, we can definitely monitor developments and hold our leaders accountable. Um, we can do what we're already doing, is, which is engaging in collaborative research, data collection, and information dissemination. Um, some colleagues at Columbia, uh, the New School, and Cornell have been working with legal experts to um, craft a statement of key uh, international uh, law principles um, to guide policymakers, healthcare workers, and, and migrants as they navigate the challenges um, of the pandemic response. And at Hopkins, uh, my colleague Clara Hahn has created a shared Google document to document anti-Asian attacks among students here. And um, the Undergraduate Inter-Asian Council has started um, the hashtag racism is a virus campaign to share stories among students who've been affected by the racialization of the epidemic. And some students, especially um, international Asian students who were targets of such attacks in Baltimore and who've been fearful of actually going out at all, have commented that these campaigns to share stories have provided us some comfort because they provided a sense of solidarity 
Mm -hmm. And we really do need to push our um, national and local leaders, as well as our university presidents and deans and secondary school principals and so forth, to make very clear statements that our communities do not tolerate bigotry and hate, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, this is something that you're very familiar with, Hari. Um, we really need to organize and mobilize, you know, give mm -hmm. voice to the vulnerable, um, do outreach efforts to vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations and conduct uh, a migrant needs assessment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jamila, go ahead. I think that was a great note to end off on. And it sort of is where I would have picked up. So this morning I was on the phone with um, people from several community organizations in the community that I live in. And we were talking about what those organizations were doing. And I was really blown away by the fact that there's a lot of organizing and activity happening on the ground um, that community organizations are already taking part in, right? We're figuring out that, you know, there's a huge problem with homeless people in our community who now you know, places where they would have been allowed to do their laundry before or to take showers before they now cannot access mm -hmm. to basic things like socks and obviously food and clothing is an issue. And I was uh, blown away, not astonished, but, but blown away by how much the organizations in my own community are already doing to meet these needs. Mm -hmm. and sometimes to the point of being out there on the front lines, um, engaging and interacting with people, so, you know, I would encourage folks to look around you. Um, it, it's likely that in, in order for many people in your community to be sustained and to survive and to make it through this, there are already a lot of people taking action. There are already a lot of people coordinating and organizing to meet needs. And I would mm -hmm. say that we can all sort of look around and figure out not just what we can do as individuals, right? But what this means going forward as sort of um, civic and political uh, beings, right? So mm -hmm. how do we get engaged once, once we can, and even now, if we can, um, to support those folks who are doing that concrete work? Um, how do we get informed from them about the ways that policies um, beyond the local level at the state or national level are affecting their work? Um, how do we get inspired um, by that work that's happening on the ground um, and focused by that work so that uh, not only are we engaging, but that we're a part of a, a kind of larger um, movement that can stem from this. I think that we can learn a lot from this. Uh, my mother would always say, don't waste your pain, right? If you're going to suffer, yeah. then learn from it. And so how yeah. can we not waste our pain with respect to civic and political engagement here so that the, the things in the world that are broken, which is a lot of what we've been talking about, have some possibility for being fixed as we move forward. Yeah, I love that, um, that uh, notion from your mom about don't waste our pain. I feel like what both of you are calling us to do in a way is to um, you know, accept that we're not just consumers of the choices that our political world offers us, but that we can work with each other to redefine new choices and to be agents in shaping those choices in our own communities. Um, so I want to open, I want to turn to questions. We've had a bunch of good questions that have um, already come in. Um, there's a question um, early on that was sent by someone named, named Mason who said, um, what is the extent to which misinformation surrounding COVID-19 is prevalent and how is that culpable for the spread of some of the xenophobia and racism um, that uh, you all have been describing? And so Aaron, maybe I'll start with you um, and see Jamila if you have anything to jump in on there. Right. I think one of the specific dangers of this moment um, as we're sheltering in place is um, the misinformation that's being spread through social media, right? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, this is compounded by the fact that we're living in you know, the era of fake news and um, people are going to less than reliable sources you know, for their news. So this is, of course, you know, spread rumors, for example, of um, 5G, you know, being the source of um, uh, spread. Um, and again, this instigates further anti-Chinese uh, sentiment. Um, you know, the 
the backlash against African migrants in, in China also came from these rumors that um, they were the ones who were causing the spread, even though um, there are really only a handful of cases among um, Africans in China um, testing positive. Um, and this was really almost mobilized online to, yeah. you know, to create these calls for um, you know, deportation of, of these migrants. So definitely this misinformation has has um, played a very insidious role. Mm -hmm. Jamila, do you have and, anything you would like to add? Yeah, go ahead. I would ch chime in and say that another facet of misinformation stems from the deep lack of trust between marginalized groups and uh, state and local and national um, governments and officials. So for the first few weeks of this, I was hearing from family members um, and friends that there was a rumor going around that Black people were immune. Uh, to COVID-19. Oh, wow. And um, there were a couple of, you know, public pieces around this. There was a lot going on um, on Twitter about this. And I had some serious conversations with family members who said, well, maybe we're immune, you know? Mm -hmm. And I started to, every time a prominent Black person would test positive, I would text and say, look, like, right. please be careful because we are not immune. Um, yeah. But I think there's such a deep distrust in the Black community that just because the government says that this thing is serious, there was a reluctance to believe that, um, and even a, se a sense that like, maybe this is our poetic justice, that somehow we're going to be um, not affected by this in the same way. And so there are just these intra-community dynamics and these relational dynamics that are embedded in the histories that we've been talking about today, and that are centered on just distrust, and distrust is what fuels misinformation. Mm -hmm. It makes mis it makes it creates a ripe environment where misinformation can spread, right? Um, so, okay, so let me turn to another question that's going to pivot us to, to thinking more about some of the global dynamics. Um, Nandini writes, um, "How might global racial dynamics affect how countries work together or not in their pandemic response?" Um, you know, she asked specifically about how it might affect things like vaccine distribution. You know, if and when that becomes available, um, particularly as we think about the relationship between higher income and lower income countries. So, Erin, maybe I'll ask you to respond first. Um, you know, um, you know, as a scholar of migration and as you've thought about these patterns in a global context, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Right. Um, well, already they've caused some major problems in terms of competing for um, scarce resources, of course, um, mm -hmm. and also um, even the border closures have um, resulted in retaliatory border closures. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but. You know, one thing that I think hasn't changed as much is the fact that we're still, um, you know, focusing um, largely on how the impact is is on kind of the rich democracies, right? And mm -hmm. um, we are paying less attention to how these very restrictive um, immigration um, emergency measures are impacting um, des other de um, destination countries. So when we deport um, stateless populations, you know, where do they go? When we deport displaced populations, um, you know, that go back to places that might have fewer resources, right? Um, mm -hmm. That that um, increases the the potential for transmission, right? Because um, there's there might be less testing and, and fewer resources and resources that have already been um, taken away. So, so at this point, um, you know, I'm not very optimistic about. Um, global cooperation, but I guess the, hmm. the one bright spot, and I think this was covered in one of the previous um, webinars, um, it was that the scientific community, however, you know, has really been um, cooperating and collaborating mm -hmm. and, and right. sharing uh, data, which I think is is really the most exciting dimension here, is, is the, the really uh, quick ways in which people have been sharing their data and, and getting it out there and, and really trying to work with each other. And I think that might be, give us um, you know, a model for how we might move forward. Yeah. Um, so Jamila, actually, that, that kind of leads directly into another question that um, someone else asked that I think maybe I'll pitch over to you, which is, um, Alexandra asked, what are the reliable sources that you mm -hmm. recommend for finding up-to-date data on reported um, racist or xenophobic attacks, um, or, you know, just some of the patterns that you've already discussed um, around what we're seeing in terms of the disparate impacts around um, coronavirus. Um, and then the, the follow on to, to the question also that she asked is also, um, are there any sources for proposed um, policy changes that can be enacted for 
um, you know, around some of the problems that we've been discussing. Yeah, that's a great, those are great questions. I mean, as far as the, the most reliable sources for, for data about, for example, patterns in terms of racial disparities with COVID-19, I would go where I always go is directly to, um, to state and local government websites and databases to a lesser extent, although um, also even national data. One thing to recognize is that that kind of data, even information about, there have been some sort of um, large and prominent uh, nonprofit organizations that have been trying to keep track of, for example, xenophobic attacks. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I guess what I would say is I'd be wary of kind of like an individual person's blog or something yeah. that you see on Facebook or Twitter or a chat room. I would look for a government entity or a national or state organization that has a long-standing reputation and history. And I would mm -hmm. be more likely to trust information coming from those sources at the same time, right? Uh, even that information should be kind of um, consumed uh, critically. We are not at the kind of height of our ability to reliably test, to test widespread, and to perfectly identify the patterns that are emerging, both with, with respect to racial disparities in COVID-19 and with respect to um, patterns of, of racial discrimination and bias um, and hate crime. So all of those things, um, the numbers across all of those categories, even when you're getting them from reliable sources are going to vary. So I would consider those numbers to be pointing in directions, flagging important issues for us, but I wouldn't sort of consider them to be, you know, um, you know, scripture or absolutely infallible because we're going to see a lot of those numbers changing over time. And I wouldn't want the changing numbers to cause people to lose their faith in the data and to say, well, maybe all of it's fake or maybe all of it's uh, made up. It, it's the patterns are real, but the specifics are going to change over time as we get better at collecting data. Very quickly, just some some policy directions. First yeah. of all, um, from the very beginning, we should have had more clear policy um, directives around what kind of data needed to be collected, how to, who was responsible for collecting it, how enforcement of those collection practices would would occur, and how that data would be disseminated in a reliable way to the public. So I actually think, you know, when it comes to the, the, the topic of information um, and trust, reliable, consistent, systematic ways of collecting and disseminating information are key for establishing trust in particular between government and its people. People need that information so they can make the right choices. Government has a responsibility to collect reliable information and to disseminate it in ways that are apolitical, irrespective of whether it makes that government look good or bad or it fits with their agenda. So that's mm -hmm. a policy change that we can implement and that we can implement pretty readily. Um, and I would say that's a place to start just with respect to the information environment. Yeah. And I should just note that that was a recommendation that was also made by one of our previous guests on one of our webcasts, um, Dr. Sharp. Josh Sharfstein, who's a vice dean for at the Bloomberg School of Public Health here, and he recommended sort of separating out sort of information about um, data around public health issues and the governmental decisions and for the reasons that you described. Um, so let me, point, let me pick up on another question that um, picks up on, I think, um, Jamila, something that you said in, in our previous conversation, um, and this might be our second to last question. Um, Laura asks, um, points out that, you know, what we're talking about is highlighting so many problems that are institutionalized. Um, but there's also the fact that fragmentation of our values of the country has also seemed to become more apparent. So how do we begin to, to write that? And I think, you know, I would just sort of add on top of that, um, Jamila, that, you know, one of the things I feel like that you were talking about is that on the one hand, we, you know, there's all this, these urgent needs that people have and a lot of the mutual aid and, and other organizations and communities are working to meet the um, immediate and urgent needs that uh, people have in this moment, but at the same time, the changes that we have have to also be structural, you know, and so how do we hold that balance between doing the immediate work in our communities, but making it add up to something bigger, you know, how do we make it so it's not just um, a band-aid solution, but so that it adds up to something bigger than, than that? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and it's a really hard one, right? Mm 
Um, I think, you know, part of the, that process is actually to pay closer. I think those, those pieces are linked, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that we were talking about, for example, in the call I was on with local community organizations in, 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 in my own community today was how do we keep records of everything that these community organizations are doing, all the holes that they're plugging, all the gaps that they're standing mm -hmm. in between so that after all this is over, we can then take that information and have kind of a sense of, oh, this is where current policies are not sufficient because when something mm -hmm. happens, we need um, these organizations to fill a gap. The gap is not already filled by current policy. So I think we can learn things from the needs that are emerging right now that will inform uh, what we do going forward. So for example, a lot of Medicaid, um, so health, health insurance for low-income people, uh, supplemental nutrition insurance, SNAP, uh, WIC, in, um, you know, nutrition and um, uh, resources for mothers, infants, and children. All of these programs in many places are now streamlining their eligibility criteria, streamlining their application criteria, mm -hmm. opening up their doors to new people who, for whom their doors were not previously open, and providing more resources more generously. Now that's something that without this pandemic would have been very difficult to achieve politically, right? And right. many people would have been skeptical of that. But now we're in a moment where, okay, we need to do it, so we're doing it. It's, it's a response to a very short-term need. But we're gonna learn things from that. What happens when we make it easier for people to access uh, the resources that they need to survive? What uh, how does this affect their their health? How does it affect their mental health and emotional well-being? We can actually pay attention to those things and figure out which of the policy changes that we're making now should we actually be holding on to, even as right. we transition into a different moment. So keeping an eye out for those kinds of questions. What are the changes that we've made now that we should actually hold on to and not let go of? And then what are the politics, uh, you know, in terms of civic and political engagement? that we need to craft in order to make that possible. Yeah. It's so interesting to me the, the points that both of you are making about the importance of just tracking and, and, and looking and maintaining the data and depoliticizing it so that we can have an honest conversation about um, what we're seeing. So um, we've come to the end of our time, but I, maybe I'll have one final question for um, both of you before we wrap up. And um, this is a sort of shorter version of a question that someone named Casper asked, which is, you know, what are the, if, if you had to point to one lesson that you hope is learned from this and changes that are made, and if you think about one lesson that you hope our country learns or that our world learns and that one change that we can make, what is it that next time when we confront a global crisis like this, we're not having the same discussion today? Um, and so I know there's not just one, but there are many, <laughs> but, um, you know, if you, if you guys could, if you all could sort of close maybe with some thoughts as to, um, you know, what, what, what is it would you like to see different in our post-pandemic world? So, um, you know, Aaron, and then I'll, I'll, Jim, I'll give you the final word. Well, um, this is something that I've been thinking about um, for a long time um, when I was, especially when I was co-directing the Racism, Immigration and Citizenship Program, um, which is really to think about the ways in which, um, you know, racism, social mobility and, and national belonging intersect because um, that really would help us to better understand the kind of multifaceted challenges of heightened xenophobia and, you know, the racially disparate uh, mortality rates that a global pandemic like COVID-19 brings. And, um, you know, what, what I, you know, would hope to move forward with, um, especially, you know, um, at an institutional level is what my um, colleague and um, uh, current director of the uh, Racism Immigration Citizenship Program, uh, Nathan Connolly calls um, institutional anti-racism, right? Because um, mm -hmm. this is a really, you know, when, we ha when we're confronted with this crisis like this, if we haven't really been thinking about the ways in which these things interact, um, I think that we're, we're we're really caught off guard. But if we have been thinking about it, I think we're, we're better prepared to really uh, face the challenges and try to, and take it up, um, advantage of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Great, Jamila, final word. Yeah, I think maybe the one thing which is a really big thing, um, but still very important and very much brought into sharp relief by this by this pandemic is that you know, deep inequality is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. The, right. So many people were living on the brink and they were living on the brink because of dynamics of race and class that have long endured in this country. 
And we sort of have been become desensitized in many ways to deep inequalities, to people who for pretty arbitrary reasons, what zip code they're born into, what color their skin is, uh, who their parents are, are living completely different lives and facing completely different opportunity structures. And what we're seeing now is that that's not sustainable. It keeps us on this edge and the, the slightest thing that happens or the biggest thing that happens, either way, many, many people are pushed over that edge. We cannot sustain deep inequalities, not inequalities with respect to race, not inequalities with respect to class, with respect to gender, with respect to ethnicity or you know, documentation status. All of those various forms of inequalities make us vulnerable and weak um, and not in some like grand global order sense, but in a human sense, right? Yeah. Um, and so we just can't live that way. And I hope that we learn going forward that we cannot live that way and that we are creative uh, and democratic in our efforts to figure out new ways to live together. Yeah. Well, thank you, Aaron and Jamila, for taking time to be with us um, here today. And I want to also thank our audience for watching and for sending in your great questions. Um, I hope that you'll join us again next Friday where we're going to be discussing the way the pandemic has affected civil liberties and democracy all over the world. Um, our guest will be Danielle Allen, who's a professor of government at Harvard and director of the Safra Center for Ethics, and Rob Lieberman, who's a professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University. Um, SNF Agora Institute Yasha Monk, um, senior fellow Yasha Monk, will be your moderator next week. So I'll look forward to seeing you all in a few weeks. And finally, I also want to mention that a recording of today's webcast will be available on our website, which is snfagora.jhu.edu. I hope to see you again next week. Thank you.